Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder. And after finishing with William S. Rosecrans, the Patreon members chose the next Confederate general to be covered, and it's the man who never could find a situation that was perfect enough, Joseph E. Johnston. Johnston has taken a lot of criticism since the end of the war, so in this biography, let's see if that criticism is warranted. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, join the Patreon page, or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. He was the first graduate in the history of the Military Academy at West Point to be promoted to a general's rank in the regular army. He was the most senior U.S. Army officer to resign his commission and go south to fight for the Confederacy in 1861. He was the only man to command both of the Confederacy's principal field armies, the Army of Northern Virginia in 1861-1862 and the Army of Tennessee in 1864. Yet Joseph E. Johnson is left out of many people's pantheon of generals that emerged during the American Civil War. Johnson's grandfather immigrated to North America, specifically Virginia, in 1726, settling near Petersburg, Virginia. His name was Peter Johnson, and he was a merchant. His son was also named Peter. When the American Revolution broke out and the colonists began to form an army to fight the British, Peter the Younger joined the American army at the age of 16, fighting under Light Horse Harry Lee, the future father of Robert E. Lee. When the war concluded, young Peter was a lieutenant. He married Mary Valentine Wood, the niece of famed Virginian Patrick Henry. Their first child died in infancy. The seventh child was born on February 3, 1807, and named Joseph Eggleston Johnston, in honor of one of Peter's commanders during the Revolution. Peter was elected a judge in 1811 and was assigned to a circuit in central Virginia, but he traded with Judge William Brockenbrough and moved to southwestern Virginia to the town of Abingdon just a few miles from the Tennessee border. Peter would build a two-story log house just outside the town with two fireplaces and a whitewashed exterior. Joe and his brothers attended the Abingdon Academy, where his father was on the board of trustees. The young Johnson men were products of the frontier despite Abingdon being a thriving center along a main route from east to west. The wilds of Virginia and Tennessee awaited the boys and on multiple occasions journeyed over the mountains into Tennessee under the watchful eye of a family slave. On one of these occasions, Joe was thrown from his horse and broke his leg, with the bone sticking out of the skin. The resilient young man was in good humor and said to his comrades, Hello, boys, come here and look. The confounded bone has come clean through. The group carried the wounded boy on their shoulders to the nearest doctor miles away. One moment in American history that captured the mind of Johnston was the Battle of Kings Mountain, the Revolutionary War engagement, that saw the over-the-mountain men, mostly of the Watauga and Nolichucky River settlements, cross into South Carolina and defeat a British force under Patrick Ferguson. Since many of the over-the-mountain men gathered near Abingdon, the story of the engagement was told and retold and took on mythical proportions. Johnston heard these stories and would reenact the battle with his friends. Joseph came to view military triumphs as the measure of a man. He was so obsessed with the military that his father recognized it and bestowed upon him the military sword he carried into battle during the Revolution. Joseph was only eight years old, with many older brothers, but he was the one his father chose to give the sword to. That sword would be an icon in Joseph's life. This became a driving force for him when he applied to the United States Military Academy at West Point. His father wrote to the Secretary of War John C. Calhoun, and told him that his son had the necessary education for entrance, and that he himself was a Revolutionary War veteran, and informed Calhoun that no one from that section of Virginia had yet to be sent to West Point. Calhoun was convinced, and Joseph was admitted into the academy. In June 1825, Johnston traveled along rugged trails and roads to New York to get on a steamboat in New York City for a ride up the Hudson River to the academy. The young man taking that steamboat up the river was about 5'7", real thin, deep brown eyes, brown hair chopped close, and had a broad forehead. The vessel steamed up the Hudson, and landed at the academy where Johnston got his first look at his home for the next four years. He entered the class of 1829 with 105 other cadets. The plebes lived in a tent city, took a preliminary exam to make sure they were ready academically to enter the academy, and then their lives as cadets began. They drilled three times a day, 5.30 a.m. to 7 a.m., noon to 1, and from 5 to 7 in the evening. 
The first classmen were in attendance to watch with critical eyes the movements of the new cadets. One of those was Albert Sidney Johnston of Louisiana, no relation to Joseph. Other young men attending West Point at the same time as Johnston was Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. The heavy demerit receiving Davis nearly got dismissed from the academy for sneaking away to Benny Haven's tavern, but narrowly avoided being kicked out of the school. This stands in stark contrast to the well-behaved Johnston, who didn't receive a single demerit that summer and only accumulated seven during that first academic year. The Abingdon Academy hadn't completely prepared Johnston for the academics at West Point. He struggled, especially with math. That first year, mathematics and French was the two main subjects for the plebes. Through hard study, Johnston became adept at reading and translating French military texts, and later on, his library would be filled with French novels, biographies, and histories. That first year at West Point was difficult for Johnston for another reason, other than his math classes. He received word in November that his mother had passed away. He asked, How is it possible for me to bear the loss of such a mother, the best, the tenderest, the most virtuous, with other than the greatest anguish? His depression at the loss of his mother led him to shy away from social circles. He would write, Alone, without a single friend to sympathize in my grief, surrounded and almost distracted by the noise and laughter of idle young men far differently situated from myself. My situation is rendered still more miserable by the contrast between their feelings and my own. However, he did find a friend. Out of the nine Virginians who came into West Point with Johnston, only two remained, Johnston and a young man from the Tidewater region of Virginia, Robert E. Lee. The two men were drawn together, one because of their father's history together, and two because both shied away from the activities that would result in demerits. Lee was better academically and on the drill field, but that didn't stop Johnston from improving upon himself. Johnston later in life would comment, in youth and early manhood, I loved and admired him more than any man in the world. As Johnston progressed through school, his weak mathematical foundation showed through, but he did well in tactics, artillery drill, and began to excel in French. His drawing skills wasn't any better than his math. Nevertheless, Johnston worked hard. He wasn't naturally intelligent, but worked for his grades. Through his academic career at West Point, he was promoted to cadet lieutenant. But, for unknown reasons, Johnston was removed from that position. It may have been because during his time at West Point, he got an infection in his eyes and was unable to see at night, and the disability convinced the academic staff to remove Johnston because he may not be able to perform his duties adequately. But that's just a theory. Although he never achieved a higher rank at the academy other than cadet lieutenant, his friends gave him the nickname the Colonel. Although this may have been a compliment, one of his biographers hypothesizes that Perhaps Johnson's peers also sought to mock him gently for his somber demeanor, for the tag implied fastidiousness and old age. Colonels in the U.S. Army of the 1820s were ancient, dignified souls, and despite his youth, Johnston was a model of restraint and dignity. In 1829, Johnston graduated 13th out of 46 cadets. He received the rank of 2nd Lieutenant in the 4th U.S. Artillery, part of which was stationed at Fort Columbus, on Governor's Island in New York. Because most of the artillery guarded the seacoast, a position in the artillery most likely meant monotonous duty on the Atlantic coast. It was a boring post. Society in New York City mitigated some of that boredom, but he was still thirsting for the heroic and dashing military life that he read about in his books as a child and in the retelling of the Battle of Kings Mountain he heard as a boy in Abingdon. Johnson stayed at Fort Columbus for two uneventful years. In August 1831, a slave rebellion known as Nat Turner's Rebellion left at least 60 whites dead, as well as the slaves who rose up and attacked the plantations in Southampton County, Virginia. In response to the violence, Johnston and his battery were ordered to Fort Monroe on the peninsula in Virginia formed by the York and James Rivers. While there, he and others were to become students at the Artillery School of Practice located at Fort Monroe. Although it may have been designed to teach about artillery and its mechanics, one general claimed it was to guard against the approaches of sloth and imbecility, or simply to give soldiers stationed there something to do and to keep them out of trouble. At the school of practice, the soldiers also cast musket balls and made cartridges for the infantry. This was called laboratory instruction, which lasted about three hours per day. Not all was work. There was still a lot of downtime, and Johnston found one of his friends, Robert E. Lee, at the fort. At night, the two would prowl around visiting junior officers and having discussions into the night. Johnston would also get to know the ladies around Fort Monroe. 
and became infatuated with some of them. When his sister-in-law accused him of being in love, Johnson wrote, I am not, never was more than a philosopher should be. I am 24, too old to believe in romance and sentimentality and too much a philosopher to be under their influence, even if they really existed. The next year, in 1832, Chief Blackhawk of the Sauk tribe and his people broke their agreement with the United States and crossed back over the Mississippi River to their homelands in Illinois. What resulted was the Black Hawk War, and artillery units would be mobilized for that war, but converted into infantry for the duration of the conflict. Major General Winfield Scott created this army that would go into the frontier. For Johnston, he was thrilled to be leaving Fort Monroe. He wrote, I am heartily tired of this sandbank. It is the most villainous abode ever occupied. Johnston and the others chosen for this expedition traveled by boat to New York City, then traveled to Albany, then took the Erie Canal to Buffalo, New York. From there, they would get on steamboats destined for Detroit. The group got on four steamers to travel through the Great Lakes. Soon after leaving Buffalo, what was called Asiatic cholera began to spread throughout the four ships. The suddenness of the illness was the most striking part about it. Within six hours, a person could be dead. Out of the about 850 soldiers who began the journey, only 200 were fit for duty when they reached their destination, Fort Dearborn, modern-day Chicago, Illinois. Johnston didn't contract the disease, but it did debilitate the entire contingent. Johnston waited at Fort Dearborn, while Scott went to catch up to General Atkinson, whose soldiers had basically ended the war in the Battle of Bad Axe before Scott arrived. Johnston caught up to Scott at Fort Armstrong on Rock Island in the Mississippi River, near the modern-day cities of Davenport, Iowa, and Moline, Illinois. There, Scott held negotiations with the Native American tribes, but without Chief Blackhawk. The other leaders, without Blackhawk, quickly signed an agreement to not come east of the Mississippi River and basically stay 50 miles from the west side of the Mississippi River. Johnston signed the document as a witness, representing his only active role during the campaign. Johnston headed back east to Fort Monroe, but was called away again because of a national crisis. The tariff bills, known as the Tariff of Abominations in the South, upset South Carolina so much that they decided to nullify the federal law. President Andrew Jackson dispatched troops to Charleston in the event of a rebellion, and Johnston was chosen to be one of those soldiers stationed around that southern city. Johnston's political views aren't known about nullification, but most of his family were states' rights Democrats, and three of his brothers were now living in South Carolina and had joined the militia. They would be the enemy to Johnston if violence broke out. However, the only battle that raged was the one in Congress, and the situation was worked out, with South Carolina rescinding their nullification. Johnson went back to Fort Monroe by way of a steamer traversing the Atlantic coast. The jostling on the ocean during all of his sea voyages made him horribly seasick. He remained at Fort Monroe for about six months, then was sent to Alabama in December 1833 to keep the peace between the land-hungry whites and the Creek tribe. Johnson would write about the expedition, think of riding so long at the rate of 15 miles per day, generally in the rain and through the most uninteresting country that has ever been created. Life is short, and I am totally opposed to loss of time, and time can never be more completely lost or misspent than a winter here. Imagine yourself living in a tent, compelled to employ yourself chiefly in turning round before a fire like meat on a spit to keep warm and consequently unable to pursue any rational occupation, and you may form an estimate of the winter I am to pass. By the spring, his unit was preparing to leave to go back to Fort Monroe, but Johnston found it hard to leave by this point. He had become smitten by at least one pretty Creek girl, but his military duties pulled him away from her. After only a short time at Fort Monroe, he was dispatched to Washington in order to help draft maps of the Midwest. Then, in 1835, he was given orders that would result in him finally fighting a human enemy on a campaign. The Seminole tribe in Florida were putting up resistance to relocation, and a war had broken out. Johnson and his group moved at once to Florida to help suppress the Native Americans there. In January 1836, Congress began funding a full-scale war against the Seminoles. Also in January, Johnson was appointed to General Winfield Scott's staff as aide-de-camp. One of Johnson's biographers explained the important moment. The young second lieutenant had barely attracted Scott's notice during the Black Hawk campaign, but now, as a member of Scott's staff, Johnston could not only observe the war firsthand from its highest levels, he would also have an opportunity to win the favor of an influential patron. Johnston's assignment was a high-profile job for a young and ambitious officer, and he was determined to make the most of it. 
Johnston and the group traveled to a location west of St. Augustine, then moved overland to Fort Drain. There, Scott concocted a plan to trap the Seminoles with three contingents, one coming from the east, another coming from the west, and his own larger force attacking from a northerly direction. The other two groups were slowed down by the marshy terrain and didn't make contact with one another. Scott's force with Johnston made it to the Withlacoochee River and a lake named the Cove of the Withlacoochee. It was here that Johnston first heard shots fired in anger, as Seminole warriors from the forest surrounding the lake and from the banks of the river fired at soldiers attempting to cross. The Seminoles fought a rear guard action, not standing to fight, but wearing away at Scott's army as it crossed the swamps of Florida. Scott and Johnston pursued them for several miles, but then gave up the chase when Seminoles crossed a river that Scott's men would have too much difficulty doing under fire. Johnston and the army marched south to Fort Brooke, arriving there on April 5th. A creek uprising in Alabama got the attention of Scott, who set off to put down the Native Americans, but he didn't bring Johnston. For about another year, Johnston suffered in the Florida heat, commanded by some men who feuded with Scott and wouldn't entrust soldiers to a former aide to Scott. Thus, Johnston languished in obscurity. Finally, in May 1837, Johnston did what many West Pointers did that year, resign. Out of the 117 officer resignations that year, 99 of them were West Pointers. He watched as juniors to him received promotions over him because they were connected to a specific regiment. The pay was horrible, especially when a trained engineer like him could make five times more in civilian life with the demand for infrastructure, and the nation didn't appreciate West Point trained soldiers at this time. They uplifted the militia and turned against the professionally trained soldiers. He had rose only one rank in his nearly eight years of service after West Point and decided to see what awaited him in civilian life. He packed his things and went back to Virginia. Under normal circumstances, a West Point graduate entering the civilian workforce could expect to land a good job constructing railroads, canals, bridges, or other infrastructure. However, Johnston couldn't have picked a worse time to leave the Army. He left during the Panic of 1837. President Andrew Jackson and his war with the Bank of the United States resulted in an economic downturn, and less projects were being funded around the country because of the lack of money. Financially, Johnston was hurting, so he turned to the government, specifically the Topographical Bureau, to work for them. It wasn't a lot of money, but it would be a steady paycheck in an uncertain time. He figured that his main role would be to draft maps, but the government sent Johnston back to Florida to help survey the 450-mile coastline from St. Augustine to the Florida Keys. He would join a group of sailors and soldiers under the command of Lieutenant Levin Powell, with Johnston being the only civilian in the group. It was a diverse group of men. The Navy had been enlisting free black men for years, so the group of sailors and soldiers contained a good amount of African American men. Johnston rekindled his friendship with another Virginian he had known from West Point, John B. Magruder. The band of men set up camp at Mosquito Lagoon, it was now December 1837, and the men celebrated Christmas with a holiday dinner of gopher soup and whiskey toddy. That night, Magruder, a future Confederate general, and William French, a future Union general, serenaded the group of men. The group explored the Florida coast and moved along the Jupiter River, where they found a herd of cattle and horses being tended by a lone Seminole woman. They interrogated the woman, and she agreed to take the soldiers to a Seminole camp. It wasn't this group's responsibility to fight Seminoles, but Powell was eager to get into a fight after an earlier attempt led him to search in vain for the elusive enemy. Powell would lead just 80 men, the majority of them sailors, to the location specified by the Seminole woman. Johnston, being a civilian now, didn't have to come, but he wanted to get into the fight just as bad as Powell. The soldiers and sailors surprised the Seminole camp with an attack, but when the Seminoles began to fire back, the sailors, many of whom had just recently been put on active duty, began to panic and refused to fire their weapons. Johnston was in the thick of the fight attempting to get his men back into it. He alleged that he found 30 bullet holes in his clothes, with two in his hat. One bullet scraped his scalp, but it wasn't enough to take him out of the fight, but left a permanent scar. The group of men fell back in near panic as a rear guard of about 25 men prevented the attack from becoming a total disaster. A contemporary later testified that Johnston's coolness, courage, and judgment won the admiration of everyone in the party. Johnston was the last one to reach the landing site and the last to board the boats. So eager was he to ensure that every member of the party was accounted for that he was almost left behind. Johnston concluded that we escaped by God's help. 
The small battle was the first time that Johnston commanded troops in combat. Oddly enough, it was when he was a civilian. Johnston's main role was to choose sites for fortifications along the coast. When the group continued their mission, they stopped where Powell had made camp over a year earlier. Powell called it Fort Dallas, but it was simply a camping area. Johnston was ordered to begin construction of a blockhouse, one of the first buildings, in what would become Miami, Florida. Many of the Seminoles lived and operated out of the Everglades in southern Florida, and when the group of sailors and soldiers got to that marshy landscape, Powell again wanted to strike at the Seminoles. Johnston and the others drug boats through the swamps because a drought reduced many of the waterways to just one foot deep. They attacked the Seminoles on a little island, but couldn't land a decisive blow before the Seminoles made their escape. The group then got to the Florida Keys, where they went their separate ways, with the Navy going to Pensacola and the Army going back to St. Augustine and other points north. Johnson would leave Florida in April 1838 and go back to Washington. In five months, Johnson had explored and surveyed over 450 miles of the Florida coast from St. Augustine to Key West. He had selected the sites for several forts and helped supervise their construction. He had fought in two battles with the Indians and provided evidence of both his bravery in combat and his leadership, and he had been mentioned favorably in dispatches. He had seen more combat during his year as a civilian than in his seven years as an artillery officer. Not incidentally, he had demonstrated his ability to fulfill the duties of a topographical engineering officer. All in all, it was much more satisfying a professional experience than his years of nondescript military service. Three months after returning to Washington, Johnson rejoined the Army, this time joined the newly formed Corps of Topographical Engineers, and got the rank of First Lieutenant, and quickly after that got a brevet promotion to Captain. Although that year out of the Army paved the way for his turn to the Topographical Engineers, it resulted in officers his junior in the Academy ranking higher than him. Nevertheless, that year away from soldiering convinced Johnston that his proper place was in the Army.